In this video, we are going to be looking at the molecular basis of heredity. And much of the work has to do with the experiments performed by this person. His name was Gregor Mendel, uh, and he did a lot of experiments with uh, peat plants uh, in his garden. Uh, and we are going to be examining some of his discoveries. First, some terminologies. Some of these terms you uh, have learned along the way uh, in the course um, already. Some are going to be uh, a little bit new, uh, but uh, let's go through them uh, one by one. First, we know what a gene is, right? We have your chromosomes, and on the chromosomes, uh, a gene is a section uh, in the chromosome that encodes for the instruction uh, to make certain proteins. Okay, so we would copy that gene uh, in the form of RNA, and then we would use it to make the protein uh, in the cytoplasm uh, using the ribosomes. Um, the genes on each of the chromosomes uh, might be uh, uh, different versions. Okay, so here we can have two uh, homologous chromosomes, uh, and on one chromosome we will have, um, say, big A, and then on the other one uh, we could have the exact same version. But over here, uh, on a separate gene, we can have big B on one and small b on another. Okay, so this might encode for blue eyes. This might encode for uh, brown eyes, uh, and over here this might encode. Um, encode for um, uh, type A blood and over here is also type A blood. So different versions of the same gene uh, is called an allele. They don't have to be different, but they could be different. If they are the same, then we call this homologous or pure. Okay, So having the same allele for a specific gene on the homologous chromosome, we call that homozygous. Okay, or pure. If they're different on the homologous chromosome, then we would say the person is heterozygous, heterozygous for this gene, uh, or hybrid. So here is another example. Uh, you have the uh, homologous chromosome here, uh, and there are many, many, many genes. And remember, homologous chromosomes are the same length, and they have the same gene order. So here we can see uh, A to O, and you have the same order on the other homologous chromosomes. Um, the versions of the gene uh, could be the same, such as this one or this one. Okay, They could be both capital, they could be both uh, a, a small case letter. Uh, as long as they're the same, then we call them homozygous. Okay, Or they could be different. Okay, One capital and one uh, small case, we call that heterozygous. So over here, um, gene C is another heterozygous uh, example. We have big C coding for uh, curly hair, and we have small c coding for straight hair. So a character is a heritable feature, uh, meaning it's something that you can pass on to the next generation, So uh, such as like flower color. Um, not everything is heritable feature. Okay, uh, Let's say you dye your hair pink, um, you cannot inherit that into the future generation. Okay, Let's say you work out a lot and you become super muscular, and your babies are not automatically going to be muscular in their life. Okay, So things that you acquire throughout your life uh, are not inheritable. Okay, Those that can be uh, inherited, uh, pass on to the next generation, we call those character. And a tray would be a variant of that character. So if we are talking about uh, flower colors uh, uh, as the character, then the tray would be a purple flowers or white flower. If we're talking about eye color as a character, then the tray uh, is going to be uh, brown eyes, blue eyes, green eyes, and whatnot. Okay. So the uh, the character is determined by um, the gene, and the tray is basically the different versions of that dream. Uh, gene, which we uh, call uh, allele. So when it comes to trait, um, there are traits that are dominant trait, and then there are recessive traits. Okay, dominant traits are the traits that will always be expressed in the individual uh, if you just have one copy of it in your chromosome. Okay, and we use capital letter to represent a dominant trait. On the recessive trait, um, we will only be able to express it if you do not have the dominant allele present. Okay, so we use small uh, uh, um, uh, letters, um, small case letter, um, to represent a recessive trait. 
Here is a table that shows you a bunch of dominant trait uh, and recessive trait in uh, in humans. Um, so uh, let's look at hair texture again. Uh, it could be uh, curly hair or straight hair. So what that means is um, we are diploid, so we have two uh, sets of each chromosome. Uh, and so for you to have straight hair, because it is a recessive trait, the only way for you to have a straight hair is when you do not have the dominant allele. So for someone to have straight hair, uh, their genetic makeup would have to be little c, little c. Okay. For someone to have curly hair, because it's a dominant trait, uh, you will be capital C and capital C, or you can have capital C and small c. Okay. So whether you are homozygous, big C, big C, or heterozygous, big C, small c, you will be curly hair because the dominant trait only requires one copy of the gene um, in order to be to be expressed. Okay, so um, it's quite interesting. You know, you can go through a bunch of these things to to take a look. Uh, for example, some people have six fingers. Uh, it's called polydactyly. Um, actually, it, you know, the full growing six finger is uh, is a little bit rare. Uh, but people with uh, polydactyly uh, sometimes they just have like maybe a little bit of a of a pinky or a little bit of a thumb. Uh, full growing fingers are quite quite uh, rare. But uh, but that would be a, that would be a dominant trait, okay? So uh, over here you can see six fingers. Uh, that's a dominant trait. So if you have five fingers, that means you would uh, have a recessive uh, trait. So like little f, little f, for example. And if your spouse also have five fingers, uh, then it's also little f, little f, which means all your kids are only going to be able to have five fingers. So if you you know if you don't like six fingers, um, then just make sure you marry someone who also has five fingers. Uh, then all your children are going to have five fingers. Um, so uh, other things, right, that are kind of interesting, right, whether you can roll your tongue or not, right, not being able to roll the tongue would be recessive, so small r, small r, uh, and being able to roll the tongue in a U shape, that would be like a, a big r, big r, or big r, small r, okay? So that's how we represent um, the traits, right, using uh, uppercase and lowercase and the genetic makeup, the, the alphabets that we use to represent them, uh, are what we call uh, genotypes. Okay, so basically, what alleles does the individual have? Okay, are they big R, big R? Uh, are they big R, small R, or small R, small R? Okay, so that would be the genotype. The phenotype would be the observable trait uh, of the person as a result, as the outcome of the genotype. So if someone is big R, big R, then they would be able to roll their tongue. So we call them a roller, okay? Uh, a big R, small R, because uh, uh, big R is dominant. Um, uh, so it will kind of cover up the small R and they would also be a roller. Uh, and if you are small R, small R, then you will be a non-roller right? in terms of whether you can roll the tongue or not. So two people, uh, two individuals can have the same phenotype. That is, they can both be a tongue roller, but they uh, are going to have different genotype, okay, different genotype. Okay, here is an example of curly hair. Uh, if you go back to this table, you can see curly hair uh, is a dominant trait. So um, even if two people, they both have curly hairs, their phenotypes are the same, but their genotype might not necessarily be the same. One might be homozygous, big C, big C. The other one would be heterozygous. Mendel's, uh, Gregor Mendel's, as I mentioned earlier in the introduction, uh, he experimented with a lot of, uh, of peat plants and then he looked at the different traits and he figured out what's dominant and what's recessive. Uh, and, you know, this is a table that summarizes his, um, his findings. Uh, and what he noticed from all his experiments, basically he had came up with two laws, okay? So the first law is what he called the law of segregation. The law of segregation states that each individual that is a diploid uh, has a pair of alleles for a particular trait. So, uh, for example, when we talk about curly hairs, right, someone is going to be big C, big C, or big C, small C, or small C, small C. So for a particular trait, in this case the curly hair, uh, there is going to be a pair of alleles. So one allele, two allele, right? Uh, one allele, two allele, one allele, two allele, and a person can only be one of these three cases for that trait. And then the parent will be able to pass on one of these alleles. 
Okay, so if you're big C, big C, uh, you can pass on one big C to your kids. Okay, if you're big C, small C, you can pass on either the big C or the small C. And if you're small C, small C, then you can pass on one small C to your child. Okay, and that's, uh, that, that, that we know is true uh, because of what we learned in meiosis, right? Um, you are going to have uh, one chromosome uh, with one of the gene, and then you're going to have the other chromosome with another gene. Uh, and during uh, meiosis, these two are going to separate. Okay? One's going to go to uh, a different cell, uh, and that's what's responsible for the law of segregation. But I don't think Mendel knew um, uh, too much about the exact mechanism of meiosis at the time. Uh, but now we know uh, that's the reason for the law of segregation. So we're going to look at his uh, experiment. Uh, and I'm just going to do this on, uh, on one note. Uh, it allows me to kind of use different colors and make this uh, a little bit easier. Uh, but, you know, you can follow along on the, on the power. In Mendel's experiment, he started with pure plants uh, of a particular tray. Okay? So we have the uh, round uh, plant here and, and because it's pure uh, and, and we can know from the table that it's uh, uh, dominant. Um, so we call that big R, big R. Okay? And wrinkle is a recessive tray uh, and it's going to be uh, small r, small r. Okay? So he didn't know they are big R, big R, and small r, small r when he did the experiment. I'll explain how he know later on. Uh, but for me to explain it to you, um, uh, we will, we will uh, assume that we know what these uh, genotypes are. Okay, so that's the P generation, the parent generation. And, and during meiosis, what's going to happen is uh, these uh, alleles, which are on separate chromosomes, are going to separate. So half the gametes are going to uh, have one of the big R. So this one kind of goes right here into this um, uh, chart. We call this chart the Panet square. Uh, uh, it allows us to predict the uh, uh, genetic makeup of the, um, of the offsprings. Okay? Uh, and the other half uh, of the gametes is going to be receiving the other R. Okay? Uh, and for the wrinkle seed, uh, half of the uh, seeds will be receiving the small r, and then the other half will be receiving the other small r. Okay, uh, and this is basically the law of segregation. The parent will only be able to uh, pass on one of the two alleles um, that they have. And so what happens is when these uh, uh, gametes fertilizes each other, so let's say this gamete fertilizes that gamete, then you will end up having a big R, small r. Okay, so this one goes here, this one goes here. Same thing for the next one. Uh, you will have the big R combining with the small r. It will be big R, small r, big R, small r, big R, small r. Okay, so uh, based on the genotype, it will be 100% big R, small r in the F1 generation, in the first generation uh, from the parents. Okay, uh, This would be the genotype, okay? genotype, genetic makeup. What about the phenotype? The phenotype is going to be 100% round. Okay, 100% round because big R is dominant, right? So, uh, like I said, Mendel, when he did this experiment, he didn't know which one is dominant, which one is recessive. But what he did find out was after he breed a bunch of round and wrinkle, he always noticed that the F1 generation is round and not wrinkle. And that made him uh, conclude that the round is the dominant tray and not the wrinkle tray. He also did um, a, a bunch of other experiments uh, with, um, uh, with other traits. So he, uh, with the uh, a color, he noticed when you, when you breed yellow and green uh, in the F1 generation, they're always yellow. So he concluded yellow is dominant. Right? In terms of the pot shape, there is inflated and constricted. And he noticed when you breed pure inflated and pure constricted, you will always end up having inflated in the F1. So that's how we know which one is dominant and which one is recessive. The next thing uh, he did was he looked at the F2 generation. What that means is you take the uh, F1 generation, you take individuals from the F1 generation, and you cross them with each other. Okay, uh, and and the next generation is something we call uh, F2. So this is the seed from F1 generation, and you can see the F1 generations. They are all big R, small r, right? They are all heterozygous uh, uh, big R, small r. So that means um, the genotype is big R, small r, big R, small r. 
Okay, uh, and we're going to use the Bennett square again to see what happens. Um, so let me try to organize this a little bit better this time. Uh, this seed, uh, the big R will go here, oh, big R, and then this one is going to go right here. Okay, so the chromosomes are going to separate, and this plant will only be able to pass on either the big R or the small R to the next generation. Uh, over here, same thing, right? One uh, R goes into half of the gametes and then the other goes into the other half of the gametes. And if the uh, uh, this R fertilizes with that R, then you end up having big R, big R like this. Okay, so one chromosome from, the, say, the father plan, right? And then the other from the mother plan. Uh, although that this is not exactly accurate description because plans are not really, um, you know, have genders. They, they are both male and female uh, parts, but uh, hopefully you get the uh, parallel here. So over here, uh, we have the big R, right? Uh, and the small r from the other plant. Uh, over here, big R and small r. And finally, we have the small r and the small r, okay? So in terms of genotype, in terms of genotype, we will have uh, big R, big R, and that is one box out of four boxes. Okay, so one out of four uh, is going to be 25%. Right? Uh, the other genotype is big R, small r, big R, small r, right? big R, small r. That's uh, two boxes out of four, or one over two, and that's 50%. Okay, uh, and then small r, small r is one quarter, which is 25%. Okay, so that's the genotype. Uh, and in terms of the phenotype, in terms of the phenotype, the uh, appearance of the plant, uh, big R, big R is going to be uh, round because big R is dominant. Big R, small r is round as well. So even though they are different genotype here, but both the big R, big R and the big R, small r, they are both going to be round. So 25 plus 50 will give me 75% round. Okay. Uh, and we will have 25% uh, uh, being wrinkled, wrinkled, okay, so that's 25%, okay. So uh, this, if I have to color it, um, these three boxes would all give rise to round seed, and then we will have uh, one box that would give rise to uh, wrinkle seed, okay, and this is the three to one ratio. Okay, so three to one ratio in the F2 generation is uh, characteristics of uh, what we call uh, uh, um, uh, uh, dominance inheritance, okay? Uh, where you have one dominant uh, gene and one recessive gene and you cross two individuals that are heterozygous, it will always produce the three to one ratio. Let's try this example together. If a red flower is dominant over white flower for a certain type of orchid, write the genotype for the following flowers. Okay, so we should highlight the traits uh, that is given to us in the question and we can come up with our own alphabets to represent the traits. Um, usually I, I go with the first letter of the uh, dominant trait. So red flower is dominant. I'm going to use capital R to represent red flower and small r to represent the white flower. So what would a homozygous red flower uh, uh, be like? Well, homozygous means the same letter and red flower is big R, so the the flower would be capital R, capital R. And for homozygous white flower, that means uh, it has to be the uh, same uh, alphabet, uh, and we have to do white flower, which is uh, lowercase r, so it will be small r, small r. Okay. In fact, this is kind of like a redundant uh, description uh, for something to have a, to be a white flower. It must be homozygous. Okay. Uh, because if if there's a capital R that's present, then um, the capital R will dominate over the white uh, white flower allele, uh, and uh, and and it will no longer be white. So you know we don't even have to say homozygous. Uh, if someone say white flower um, in this context, then it has to be small r, small r. 
heterozygous red flower heterozygous means uh, different um, so big R small R uh, since the big R is dominating um, so it will it will show up in in the um, in the uh, in the character uh, and it's gonna be red flower heterozygous white flower so as I mentioned this is not possible heterozygous means has to be different so big R small R but if it's different, then it wouldn't be white, right? In order for you to have the white flower, it must be small r, small r. So this is not possible. Not possible. Okay? Example two. Uh, consider a type of orchid where red flower allele, big R, is dominant uh, over the white flower allele. So pretty much same as the previous question. Uh, predict the phenotype and genotype of the F1 generation for the following crosses. So you can um, try this on your own, right? pause the video and then uh, uh, take a look at whether you get it or not. Or if you're not sure how to do this, uh, just keep watching for now. So there is a hybrid red, right? Hybrid means uh, heterozygous. Uh, and in this case, heterozygous red would be big R, small r. Okay, cross with a white flower. They didn't mention whether it's hybrid or pure, but because white is the recessive allele, so we know it must be small r, small r. Once you've determined the genotype of the uh, P generation, the parent generation, um, the next thing you're going to do is you're going to do a Panette square. Okay, so draw something like this, kind of like, you know, tic-tac-toe. Uh, and you're going to determine the alleles uh, uh, that are going to be found in the gametes of each parent. Right? So it doesn't matter which, uh, where you put the, the parent plants. Okay? Uh, uh, you can take this parent plant and then you can put the alleles here on the side or you can put it up here. It doesn't matter. So during meiosis, the big R, small r will separate. So half the gametes will be carrying the big R. The other half will be carrying the small r. For this one, Half of it will be carrying the small r, and the other half will be carrying the small r as well. So it will be like that. And when we do the calculations, when we do the um, fertilization, if the big R combines with the small r, then we have big R, small r, and the big R combined with the small r, it will be big R, small r, uh, small r, small r, and then same thing, small r, small r. Okay? So let's express the uh, uh, answer in percentage for genotype and phenotype. So genotype, genotype is going to be uh, two out of four. So fifty percent, fifty percent big R small R, and then we're gonna have fifty percent small R small R. In terms of the phenotype, in terms of the phenotype, uh, big R small R is red, uh, and so it will be fifty percent red and 50% uh, white. Okay, so that's how you do this question. Now, uh, to make this a little bit simpler, okay, and, and you don't have to do this uh, next step if you are not uh, comfortable, but I'm just gonna show you how to do this in a, in a simpler way, okay? Um, so here we have um, the same setup. We have big R, small r, and then we have small r, small r, okay? So we can we can do our chart uh, again, but what happens is uh, over here we have big R small R, so the uh, uh, alleles are going to go right here, big R small R, and here because they are the same letter, so rather than writing it twice like we did here, we can only just write it once. Okay, so whenever the alleles are the same, you don't have to do it two times; you can just do it one time. Okay, uh, and you can just carry on like normal. So big R, small r, like this, and then small r, small r. Okay, so now the genotype, genotype, right? We have one out of two boxes, so that's still 50%, right? 50% big R, small r, and then one out of two boxes for uh, small r, small r, right? So we end up having the same answer, right? It's only here that we have two out of four boxes for big R, small r, which is 50%, and here we have one out of two boxes, which is 50%, okay? So whichever you prefer, right? Um, some people find this more, uh, a little bit clearer because you write out everything, uh, but this uh, saves you a little bit of time, okay? And you can, again, right, the, the shortcut here is if it's the same allele, uh, you don't have to write it more than once, okay? You can just do it one one column or one row, okay? Um, so, you know, 
pick your favorite method. Let's try another one. Uh, again, it's the same question, uh, but this time we have pure red and pure white. Okay, so pure red uh, means homozygous, so it's going to be big R, big R, right? Pure white. Well, they didn't say pure white, but then we know it's pure, right? Because white is recessive, so it has to be small r, small r. Um, so that means when we set up our table, when we set up our table, uh, we can draw the full table, but we don't have to fill up the whole thing necessarily, right? Uh, we can take a look at the genetic makeup and decide how much to fill up. So for example, big R, big R, uh, it's the same allele for both chromosomes, so I can only uh, I can write it only just once, okay? We don't have to do it two times. You could if you want, okay? But be consistent, right? Okay? Be consistent. If you do it twice here, you're going to do it twice there as well, right? Uh, so I'm just going to write it one time. And here, small r, small r, uh, because again, it's the same thing. I'm just going to write it once. So that means when I do the uh, combination, we will have big r, small r, and there's only one box. So 100% big r, small r, that would be the genotype. Uh, and in terms of the phenotype, big R, small r is red, so it would be 100% red. Okay? These type of questions are called monohybrid crosses uh, because you're tracking one trait at a time. Uh, and there are a lot more examples uh, and practice questions in the study guide, so make sure you spend some time and go through them uh, yourself. For now, we are going to move on to dihybrid cross questions, where we will be tracking two traits at the same time. So this is uh, from a table that we saw earlier. Uh, we can see in terms of seed shape, a round is dominant over wrinkle. Uh, and in terms of seed color, yellow is dominant over green. So let's take a look at what happened when you take a pure round yellow seed and you cross it with a pure wrinkle green seed. So because the round is dominant, we can use big R uh, to represent that. And we will use um, lowercase r to represent wrinkle. We will use capital Y for yellow and small y for green. Okay, so let's uh, move on to the next page for uh, more space. Okay, so, uh, actually, sorry, let's stick, stick with this um, this page uh, instead. Um, so we have big R, big R, big Y, big Y for round yellow seed. Uh, and over here, we have small r, small r for wrinkle and small y, small y for green. Okay, so what happens is um, if I do the Panet square, okay, uh, the um, uh, uh, <coughs> alleles that we're going to have um, will be uh, big R combining with big Y. So we're going to put it right there. Remember, we're tracking two traits at the same time. So that's why we are um, uh, doing two letters, okay? But they should never be the same letter, right? Uh, because the R and the R will separate during meiosis and then Y and Y will separate uh, from each other. Uh, but then one uh, gamete will be carrying big R and big Y, uh, and then the other one will be the same in this case. Uh, as for the uh, recessive, tra um, the, the other um, uh, uh, seed here, we have the small r, small r separating, uh, and then we have the small y, small y separating. So that's going to give us the uh, small r and small y uh, like that. So if they are going to fertilize uh, each other, then we will have big R, small r, followed by big y, small y. Okay. So in terms of the uh, genotype, <coughs> it is going to be 100% big R, small r, big y, small y. And in terms of the phenotype, it will be 100%. Uh, big R, big, big R, small R will give you round seeds, and big Y, small Y will give you yellow seed. Okay, so this would be this would be the F1 generation. Okay, big F1 generation. This here would be the P generation. Okay, P generation, the parents. Okay, <clears throat> so now we're gonna look at what happens if we take the F1s, uh, the round yellows, and then we cross them with each other. Remember, these are uh, from the F1 generation, um, so they are going to be uh, hybrid um, in, as opposed to pure, um, which means the genotype is going to be big R, small r, and big Y, small y. And over here, the exact same thing.
right so um, how are we going to create the gametes okay what are they gonna look like so let's uh, say the um, allele for uh, round and wrinkle is on one chromosome uh, and, and I'm gonna put the big R here these are sister chromatids um, that you get after um, DNA replication and over here I'm gonna put the small r small r like that okay so that's the tetrad that will form during uh, prophase uh, one of meiosis and let's say the uh, allele for color is going to be on a different chromosome and over here I'm gonna put the big Y here and the big Y here and at the bottom uh, it's gonna be um, the small y small y okay so in uh, meiosis uh, they're going to separate like that uh, let me try to draw a better line they are going to separate like that uh, and what that means is uh, in the end you will end up having one uh, uh, two of the cells carrying a big R big R big Y right? and you ain't gonna end up having two other gametes carrying small R and small Y right but there is there are no rules that says they have to uh, arrange in this particular order right in other words um, the uppercase chromosomes does not all have to line up on the same side just by random chance uh, the small y could have been here instead and then at the bottom you have the big y right like that and if that's the case then um, two of the gametes they are going to have the big r small y uh, combination and the other one they are going to have the small r big y combination okay uh, and that creates a total of four different uh, types of gametes that you can create uh, in this plant that is hybrid for both of the traits in fact this uh, random arrangement of chromosomes that occurs uh, in the metaphase one of uh, of uh, of meiosis uh, is called the law of independent assortment right so Mandel had another law right the law of segregation uh, where it states that uh, a parent can only pass on one of the two alleles that they have uh, in the genome in the law of independent assortment it states that the genes do not influence each other with regards to uh, the sorting of alleles into gametes every possible combinations of alleles for every gene is equally likely to occur and that's what we did over here, right? We create all the possible combinations uh, with two, two alleles. So how do you do this uh, a little bit quicker without drawing it out like that? Well, uh, you can kind of uh, use this uh, um, uh, 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 strategies, okay? So we have a big R here. So big R will either combine with big Y or it will combine with small Y, right? So that means uh, we are going to have big R big Y and big R small Y right? similarly uh, the small R can combine with big Y or it can combine with uh, small Y so you will have uh, these two combinations okay so whichever way you prefer right, you can figure out all the different combinations and we're gonna have to put them in a panette square right so that that's what this um, next page is okay, let me just uh, copy these things I'm gonna pull it down here so you can see them clearly and remember it's the same for the other um, other uh, 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 seed right because they are both from the F1 generation um, so this is gonna be a much bigger chart um, than the one we did uh, before right? and I'm just gonna copy all these um, different combinations uh, over here so for one of the seed we will have big R big Y big R small y small r big y small r small y so that's from one single seed now we're going to have the other one which is basically the exact same thing okay exact same thing like that okay um, so take a moment and try to fill this whole thing in uh yourself right uh, i i will um i i will pause the recording and uh write down the answer first uh, so you'll be able to compare it uh with uh with yours so I changed my mind. Actually, I'm uh, I'm just gonna uh, do it uh, uh, live with you. Um, you might have done it already, and, and if you did, you can just compare the answers with me. So let's say this one and this one combined, and we will have big R, big R, big Y, big Y. Okay. Next one, this will combine with this, so we'll end up having big R, big R, big Y, small Y. Okay. This will combine with this, so big R, small R big y big y this combines with this so we will have big r small r big y small y and so on and so forth right you can keep on 
combining um, the various gametes together uh, and you can see there are quite a lot of different combinations right here okay so another one we always write a capital first before we write the uh, lowercase that's just a convention that people use when they do this kind of questions uh, small r small r big y small y big r small r big y small y this one with this one will give you that and then the next one and then the next one okay so let's try to figure out the um, the phenotype here okay phenotype okay um, genotype is a little bit all over the place um, and we want to focus on a phenotype uh, for this example so let's see what we have okay I'm just just gonna use different color this one is gonna be uh, round and yellow round and yellow okay big R and big Y right so let's look for another one that's round and yellow this one is round and yellow uh, this one is round and yellow this one is also round and yellow okay so even though the genotypes are different for all of them but they're all round and yellow because they all have one capital R and one capital Y and okay, so these are all the uh, round and yellow and then there's another round and yellow here and another round and yellow I think that's all the round and yellow and if we count them it's one two three four five six seven eight nine so there is going to be a total of nine out of sixteen that's going to be round and yellow okay? it's not going to be a nice number if we do this in a percent so I'm just going to leave it as a fraction uh, let's look for another phenotype um, this one is round and green remember uh, small y codes for green right so this is round and green uh, do we have another one that's round and green uh, right here that's round and green and uh, there is another one that's round and green okay so a total of uh, three out of 16 being round and green uh, what else do we have we have let's choose a different color we have uh, over here wrinkle small r small r is wrinkle wrinkle and yellow another wrinkle and yellow over here and then other wrinkle and yellow All right so a total of total of three out of 16 okay, I'm running out of space here three out of 16 that's wrinkle wrinkled and what did I say yellow okay and finally there's just one more one more here uh, that one is one out of 16 uh, and that is wrinkle wrinkled and uh, green okay so this would be a nine to three to three to one ratio okay which is the standard ratio for a dihybrid cross uh, if you start with pure uh, traits in the parent generation okay uh, if I go back to the PowerPoint slides here there is a much nicer diagram with the complete with the shape and correct shape and size uh, uh, and, um, and color of the seed uh, if you want to go through this uh, one more time yourself okay let's try a dihybrid cross question oh there it is the same diagram again uh, but now let's try a dihybrid cross question right says here the, in bees normal wings are dominant to vestigial wings okay, so vestigial wings are kind of like tiny mini wings that don't quite work uh, and so that that's one tray here right we have normal wings dominant over vestigial wings uh, and uh, for me I like to use the um, capital letter for the dominant trait to represent the uh, the allele so uh, you can use capital N or capital W I guess it makes more sense to use capital W right wings okay so this is normal wings and this would be vestigial wings uh, and then there is another tray the other tray is deep pollen sacs are dominant to shallow pollen sacs right so dominant pollen sacs we will put um, a big D and the shallow one will be small D okay so uh, one mistake I see people 
do is they use sep d different letters for the same tray. Okay, so don't do that. Né? Don't put like big, don't put W here and then and then V here. Okay, these are just two variants of the same tray, uh, and so you should have the same alphabets. Okay? One capital, one uh, lowercase. So what's uh, what's the cross here? Well, in this question we have a male bee with vestigial wings and shallow pollen sac. Okay, so this is the male, the male. Okay, if you want to use symbols, you can. Uh, this is the male, uh, and we have vestigial wings. Since it is a recessive tray, then it's going to be w, small w, small w. Okay, they don't even have to tell you it's homozygous or not, um, because it has to be homozygous, right? Uh, shallow pollen sac, nice right? shallow pollen sac. That would be uh, the small d, small d, like this. So the male with uh, 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 homozygous uh, vestigial wings and homozygous uh, shallow pollen sac will cross with a female. Okay, this is the female. Female symbol looks like this. Uh, and what do we have for the female? The female is homozygous normal wings and heterozygous deep pollen sac. Right, homozygous normal wings is capital W for both and heterozygous deep pollen sac would be big D, small d. Right, so now that we have the genotype of the uh, parents, we can go ahead and do the Panet square. Okay. So uh, let's see how many how many different uh, uh, columns and rows we have. Right. Um, for the male, uh, there is only one possible combination. Right. Uh, the uh, small w will combine with the small d or the small d, which is the same thing. And this w can combine with the small d and small d, which also would be the same thing. So all of the male's um, uh, uh, sperm in this case would be small w and small d. So we don't have to do separate uh, four separate rows. We can just stick with one, one row because it's all the same. For the female, we will have um, big w and big d. And we will have uh, big W and small d. Okay, and over here, uh, big W and big D, we have that already. And then we have big W and small d, we also have that already. So there's no need to do more. Uh, and so your chart is just going to be like that. Okay, so again, this is the male, this is the female. Uh, and now we can combine the um, alleles. Okay? And we can see there's 50% like that. And then the other 50% is going to be uh, like this. Okay. So in terms of genotype, genotype, 50% big W small W big D small D, 50% um, big W small W small D small D. In terms of phenotype the actual appearance, we will have 50% of the bees being normal wings, normal wings, plus uh, big D, small d, that's the deep sac, deep pollen sacs, and then the other 50% would be also normal wings, normal wings, and uh, small d, small d, that would be the shallow, shallow pollen sacs. And that's how you do a dihybrid cross question. Moving on, let's try another example. Assume curly hair, capital C, is dominant to straight hair, lowercase c. So I give you the alphabets, you don't even have to come up with it yourself. Albinism is a condition in which cells which normally produces pigment does not do so. A person with this condition is called an albino. So their skin appears to be quite light in color. Uh, the allele for skin albinism is small n. It's recessive to the normal allele capital N. A woman with Okay, and this is the part where we should do some highlighting, I guess. Um, the woman with um, curly hair and albinism. Okay, and then we have the man uh, who is going to be 
uh, having straight hair and normal skin color. Okay, so what would their alleles be? Right, so for the woman, for the woman, uh, I'm just going to use a symbol here. The woman is going to be curly hair, which is going to be uh, a, a capital C and not sure at this point because the question did not say whether it is uh, uh, homozygous curly or heterozygous curly. So I can just put big C and then um, uh, a blank. Uh, but she does have albinism and that is a recessive trait so that means she is going to be small n small n uh, and for the father for the father um, he is going to have straight hair and straight hair is small c small c uh, with normal skin and so we don't know what uh, the genotype is whether it is homozygous normal skin or heterozygous normal screen uh, so we can just put like big n and uh, and um, and, a, and a blank okay uh, but there is information about their kids as well okay they had a child and the child has straight hair and is albino okay so the child uh, we're gonna put right here the child is going to be have straight hair so that would be small c small c and he is an albino so that would be a uh, small n small n all right so let's do some backwards thinking uh, remember the uh, kid must have inherited the uh, half the genetic material from mom and half from dad right so um, there are two small c here one of the small c must have came from dad and then where did the other small c come from well it has to be from the mom right uh, and since the other allele is big c that means this one must be small c okay uh, otherwise the mother would not be able to pass that to the child uh, you can use similar logic here one of the n small n must be from the mother and that means the other small n must be from the father right so by looking at their child we are going to be able to uh, figure out the genotype of the parents that's it for dihybrid crosses for now. Uh, you can find more examples uh, in the study guide. Uh, now let's talk about something called incomplete dominance and co-dominance. Uh, the best way for me to explain this is to give you an example. <clears throat> so let's say there is a is a type of flower. Okay, so big R, big R will represent uh, a red flower. Okay, red uh, allele, and small R will represent the white allele. So based on what we've learned so far, uh, something like a like a big R, big R, right, would be uh, uh, would turn out to be a, a, a red flower. Okay, so over here that would be a big R, big R. That's the red flower. Uh, we have no problem understanding that. Uh, and for it to be a white flower, it would have to be small R, small R. Okay, so um, using the same kind of uh, 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 principles that we've learned so far, uh, the big R, small R would have been also a red flower because uh, capital R is dominant over small r. However, uh, we are talking about uh, a, a different type of inheritance pattern called incomplete dominance and co-dominance. So in the case of uh, in the case of incomplete dominance, the heterozygous condition, right, that is the big R small r, is going to appear to be um, somewhat in between the dominant and the uh, other uh, recessive trait. Okay, it's not actually correct to call it recessive trait anymore, uh, because when you put them together, you neither see the red or, or or the white. You see something in between. Okay, so like a pink flower, that would be an example of incomplete dominance. Okay, so the uh, homozygous uh, uh, versions are going to be uh, blended together to create something in the middle. In the case of co-dominance, uh, the heterozygous condition, uh, rather than having a blend in the middle, uh, both uh, would be expressed. So you would have both white flower uh, petals and, 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 and red flower uh, petals at the same time. Right? Um, and, and this is what we call co-dominance. Right? Uh, let's try an example here. We have uh, something called Snapdragon, right? So in Snapdragons, red flower is incompletely dominant over white. So it was stated in the question uh, that it is a, a question dealing with co-dominance or incomplete dominance. Okay, you won't have to guess what it is. Uh, the heterozygous condition produces pink flower. Uh, what will the result of a cross between two pink flowers uh, uh, of um, two pink flowered Snapdragons be? 
Right, so uh, pink flower, as the question tells you, is going to be the heterozygous condition. So we can use big R, small r uh, for that. So here we have a pink flower and a pink flower. And if you go ahead and do the um, uh, Panette square, then we will have uh, big R, small r for one of the pink flowers and it's big R, small r for the other one. And so when you go ahead and do the uh, uh, Panette square, you will see that um, there will be 25% um, of the uh, flowers would be red. Okay, so that's the one that will be red over here. And we will have 50% uh, that is going to be big R, small r. So that would be the pink one. That would be the pink one. 50%. Okay, and we would have another 25% that's going to be to be white. Okay, that's how you do the incomplete dominant question. It's quite straightforward, actually. It's the exact same thing. The only difference is you have to know that the heterozygous condition uh, is not the same as the dominant one. Uh, another example. Uh, in example 7, a red bull crossed with a white cow produces a wrong calf. The wrong calf has intermingled white and red hair. Uh, if a wrong bull is crossed with a white cow, what percentage of calves would be wrong? So the wrong version is the uh, incomplete, uh, so it's the rather uh, co-dominant uh, version, right? Um, because uh, they have the, both the white hair and the red hair. Okay, so I'm going to call the red one big R, we can call the white one small r, and the wrong, which is somewhere in between, is big R, small r. Okay? In fact, I could put, put big R, big R for red, and small r, small r for white in this case. So we have a wrong bowl, so that's big R, small r, crossed with a white cow. Okay, white cow is small r, small r. Um, so if you do the Panet square, okay, big R, small r will separate during meiosis. Uh, if both are small r, I only have to do it once. And when you combine them together, you will see that 50% of the calves would be wrong. Right? So 50% big R, big R, uh, which is equal to 50% wrong. Okay? The other 50% would have been the white cow. Uh, last but not least, we're going to look at something called sex-linked conditions. All the conditions we've studied so far are called autosomal inheritance because the alleles are found on the autosomes, okay? So uh, through chromosome 1 to 22 uh, rather than on the sex chromosomes. But some alleles are found only on the sex chromosome, X or Y, uh, and we call these X-linked disorders if it's found on X alone uh, or Y-linked um, disorders if it's only found on Y. If it's a Y-linked condition, then only males can get it. Uh, if it's an X-linked condition, then uh, uh, it turns out males are more likely to get it than females because females, they have two X copies. Uh, and if it's a, 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 a recessive disorder, then both X copies have to contain the mutation in order for it to show up. So examples of that include uh, hemophilia, which is a, a, a condition where you have trouble clotting your blood um, if you have a cut for example, uh, there's color blindness as well. So let's take a look at uh, some examples here. Consider color blindness. Find the ratio for the F1 generations between these uh, crosses. Okay, so a carrier female and a normal male. A carrier is someone who is normal, so no color blindness, but they carry the color blindness gene on one of the chromosome X. Okay? Males cannot be carrier because they only have one chromosome X, right? They either have it or not have it. But females, because there are two X uh, chromosomes, so they, they could be carrier, right? So let's see the um, uh, carrier uh, female over here. Uh, um, carrier female would be uh, uh, XX, okay, XX for the female. And one of the copy would be normal, so we put big C and then the other would be small c. Okay, so this is the colorblind uh, uh, allele. Okay, uh, we're gonna cross it with a normal male. So normal male would be x with a normal allele and y. We don't have to put any superscript on y because the y chromosome uh, does not carry 
the uh, allele of interest here, right? Uh, and so what's going to happen when they are going to have kids? Well, we will have to do the Panet square, just like we do in the other ones. So for the female, half of the X will be chromosome X with the normal C, and then the other would be the X chromosome with the disease C. Okay, uh, So one capital, one small. For the male, it would be uh, half the sperm carrying the uh, normal uh, X, and then the other one would be the Y chromosome. And if you go ahead with this uh, uh, Panet square, right? if this sperm fertilizes this egg, then they are going to have a daughter with normal vision, okay? because it's going to be capital C for both cases. Uh, if this sperm fertilizes this egg, then they are going to have a daughter who will also have normal vision, but now is a carrier, right? right? Because of the small c right here. Uh, if this sperm fertilizes that egg, then they will have a normal vision son. And the last case, they will have a colorblind, colorblind son. Okay, colorblind son. Okay, maybe I'll just uh, use a red here to highlight the disease allele um, so you can see it more clearly. Okay, so find the ratios of F1 generation. Well, you will have 100% normal vision daughter. Okay, that means if you're going to have a daughter at all, 100% uh, chance that they are going to be okay. Uh, for the for the boys though, right, for the boys, if you just look at the boys column, uh, there is a 50% chance, 50% chance you will have a normal vision, normal vision son, and then there is going to be a 50% chance of normal, uh, sorry, of colorblind, I'll say CB, colorblind son. Okay, so uh, this would be for daughters, this would be for son. Okay? Uh, if you want to uh, combine the results, then you will say um, there is going to be uh, a 50% chance, because now you're looking at all four boxes, right? So there's going to be two out of four boxes, right? So you can say, or, or you can say 50% chance uh, normal vision daughter or uh, you're going to have 25% chance of uh, normal vision son and then 25% chance of colorblind son. Okay, so the difference between this uh, answer and this answer is that this uh, you will only look at each gender separately. Because you look at girls on its own and you look at boys on its own. This one is look at, you know, children in general. Okay, so if you uh, take in account of all possible combinations, right, then that's how you're going to uh, answer it. Um, typically, this is, the, uh, this is the answer that, uh, that we'll be um, uh, using, uh, unless the question specifically asks you about the son or specifically asks you about the daughter. Okay, let's try another one uh, together and then you can do the... Um the last one yourself, I guess. We have a normal male here with a colorblind female. So normal male would be X, Y with the normal uh, capital C on the X and the colorblind female, colorblind female would be X with a small C and X with a small C. Okay, in order for the female to be colorblind, both copies of the chromosome X must carry the colorblind gene. Uh, and so if you do the Panet square this time, uh, the man, half the sperm would be X with the normal color, uh, color blindness gene, the one that, that doesn't give you color blind, blindness. Uh, and then the other half of the sperm would have the Y chromosome. Uh, for the female, 100% of the um, eggs will be X with the color blind gene, the diseased one. Uh, and the other one would be the same, so I don't have to do it twice. And if you go ahead with the, um, with the Panet square, you would have uh, X capital C and X with a small c. Okay, And over here, you will have X with a small c from the mother and Y over here.
Okay, so that means uh, uh, you will have 50% chance of having a normal vision, uh, a, a, a daughter, okay, and you will have 50% uh, chance of having a colorblind son. Okay, so you see, the males are more likely to have the uh, 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 X-linked disease than the females because in females there is a backup copy of X, right? Both copies have to be diseased in order for it to show up. But for male, if you inherit the, uh, the disease uh, X chromosome, then guarantee you're going to have that disease. Um, you can try the next two yourself and maybe we'll take it up um, during the tutorial. Uh, this is the, is this the exact, exact same example? I think they are, it is, uh, I just probably made a mistake in doing this. Um, so uh, I'm going to skip through that. Um, now we're going to look at what's called pedigree. Okay. So in a pedigree, uh, we have a square representing a uh, male. Okay. Square is male. Square equals to male. Uh, and if it's, uh, um, uh, not colored in, then it is normal. Okay, so normal male. Okay, uh, if you have a, a square, uh, but it's shaded in, right? Then this would be that's this would be uh, a, a male with the condition. Okay, so male with um, a, the condition of interest. Okay, so with color blindness, for example, with um, sickle cell anemia or, or whatever you're looking at, right? Uh, same thing. For a uh, circle, that's female, normal female. Okay, and then if you have a shade in circle, then that would be the female, female with condition. Okay, um, sometimes you will also see this. You will see uh, a circle that's half shade in. Okay, then that's carrier female. Okay, carrier female. Okay. There's no carrier male uh, because you for, for X-linked disease, there's no carrier, right? You either have it or you don't have it. Uh, but you can have a carrier a male if you're just talking about an autosomal, uh, autosomal um, trait. Okay, so this is called pedigree, okay. which shows you the relationship between families. So uh, each row is one generation. Uh, so here are the grandparents if we're looking at three generations. Um, they got married and then they have kids, right? So uh, you can trace the line and all the uh, people who are connected through this line, this one, this one, and this one, they are all children of uh, these two individuals, okay? So they, they had two, uh, they have three, three daughters, okay? Uh, and each of these daughters would marry a man and they would have their own family, okay? So these two individuals, they would have two daughters and one, um, one son. Uh, these two, they would have uh, three son and uh, and one daughter, and one and the daughter is going to uh, contain the disease, uh, and one of the three sons will have the disease. Okay, so based on this uh, pedigree, uh, what do you think is the pattern of inheritance? Okay, so pattern in inheritance, we have uh, for example autosomal dominant, right? That's uh, a, a, a dominant. Uh, disease condition carry in the uh, uh, in one of the autosomes. You can have autosomal recessive, right? You can have uh, uh, X-linked recessive or X-linked uh, dominant. Those are the ones that we've talked about, right? So over here, uh, a key giveaway is that um, you have two parents who are normal, but then um, they have kids who have a particular condition. And that's a key sign that shows you this is autosomal recessive, right? Okay? Um, and that's because if I, if I zoom in over here, uh, if they are diseased individuals, we can um, uh, say that they are small r, small r, for example, right? Uh, but the parents are normal, so that means they both must actually be carrier of the condition, okay? So you, you could have shaded those uh, halfway like that, okay? So this... Uh, if parents are, are normal, right, uh, in terms of phenotype, uh, but they have diseased uh, 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 children, um, then that's a giveaway sign that the inheritance pattern is autosomal recessive. So that's it for this video. We've learned a lot of different types of examples, uh, monohybrid, dihybrid, incomplete, 
numerical dominance, uh, sex length, uh, and we looked at uh, an example of pedigree. Uh, make sure you go through the material yourself, uh, and we will probably have uh, a lot more practice um, during the uh, tutorial section. Uh, thank you for watching. That's it for lecture eight.